Anybody who has children has likely heard the phrase, it's not fair. Even if, it, even if you don't have kids, uh, if you've got nieces, nephews, if you know somebody who has children, you've heard children shout those words out loud and clear. When children don't get something that they think they should get, when a sibling gets some, something and they don't, doesn't take long before those words come out of their mouths. And let's just not put this on kids either, because sometimes, um, although we might not say the words, there are times when we very much we think those words. One example is when I go to, uh, when I've gone in the past to renew my cell phone contract. I've been with the same company for a long time. And, and when I go to, and I try to get the deal that they're offering newcomers and they won't offer that one to me, I think that's not fair. You know, as I thought about the readings this week, it became very clear that the whole notion of fairness isn't some recent construct, but something that's been around for years. I'd like us to spend some time with our readings, reflecting on them in the hope that through them, we might hear God speaking to us today. We might experience God working within us. So I want to title the sermon today, It's Not Fair. I want us, first of all, to to start with our passage from um, that reading from Exodus. If, you, uh, if we look at the context of that passage, um, you'll remember that over the past few weeks, we've been going through the story. A few weeks back, we heard about the call of Moses when God spoke out, out, of, out of a burning bush, calling Moses to lead God's people out of Egypt to go to the promised land. And there was a fairly lengthy negotiation between Pharaoh and Moses. Finally, Pharaoh let the people go. Moses through, and God through Moses brought deliverance to the people of Israel. They were no longer slaves. They were free. I can just imagine them rejoicing as they were finally leaving Egypt. Yet I don't know whether you noticed or not, but in our reading today from Exodus, um, in a mere matter of of five verses, the word grumble appears six times. The people are hungry, and so they grumble and complain to Moses and Aaron. Now, just to put this into perspective, I think it's helpful to point out that this, it's not as though by this time the people of Israel are well on their journey. It's not as though it's been a long time since they've left Egypt and they've just, they're just getting, they're just tired. No, remember, the journey lasted 40 years. Well, if we were to look at verse 1 of Exodus chapter 16, we, will, we would discover that they were only a month past leaving Egypt. So they aren't well on their journey. In fact, they're only um, one-fifth of one percent along their journey, and already they're complaining. Now just imagine taking your, going in a, on a car ride with your kids, and maybe leaving from here at the church, and um, going to Edmonton, and it would be like your kids complaining before you even got onto Stony Trail. Mom, Brad is bugging me. Dad, Mary's been at the window too long. It's not fair. You know, it didn't take long for the people of Israel to start complaining. And the thing that's so striking is the fact that Not only are they just one month past Egypt, but they're just one month past that incredible event that happened at the Red Sea. Remember what God did for them as God parted the waters and the people walked on dry land to cross the Red Sea. Can you imagine such an experience? 
you think that would have sealed it for the people. Convince them that they could trust God and that God was going to be with them through anything. And yet, barely a month later, and the people are complaining because they want something to eat. Listen to what it says in verses 2 and 3. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died at the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. In essence, the people of Israel are saying to Moses and Aaron, it's not fair. As they thought back to their Egyptian oppressors, they knew that they had all the food that they needed. It just wasn't fair. Because the Egyptians, as far as they were concerned, the Egyptians, they didn't deserve it. And naturally, the people of Israel did. And did you notice what, in fact, they were saying? If only we had died in Egypt by the Lord's hand. If you think back to what happened just before the people of Israel left Egypt, the very last plague was the, the death of some of the Egyptian children. And the, the, um, God passed over the Hebrew people. Well, here they're saying, if only we had died like they did. God, remember, we are your people. We are the good ones here. The people of Egypt had it way better. Lord, you let them die and left us alive. Oh my goodness, God, it's just not fair. And how did God respond? Well, if you or I had been God... Let me tell you how I think many of us would have responded. You ungrateful so-and-sos. After all I did for you, after I proved to you that I cared and that you could trust me completely, and you come back to me with this? You know, I think if I'd been God, I think I would have said, okay, suit yourself. Go on back to Egypt. I'm done with you. I'll find others who will trust? Good thing for the people of Israel that I'm not God. Because Yahweh, the God who led the people out of Egypt, didn't do anything like that. Instead, the passage told us that God gave them bread from heaven in the morning and meat in the evening. Despite the people not deserving any of it, God poured out his grace. He poured out his grace upon them. So I want us to leave that passage and turn our attention now to our passage from Matthew's Jesus story. If there was ever a situation that sounded unfair, it's the story Jesus told his disciples about a landowner who hired some laborers to go out and do some work in his vineyard. You know, such landowners would not have been uncommon back in the days of, of Jesus and his disciples. The disciples would have been able to picture the scene quite clearly as Jesus told the story. A wealthy landowner with a lot of land, needing workers to bring in the harvest. Now, the sense I get is that as far as the landowner is concerned, there's a real sense of urgency here. He needs the job to get done quickly. I don't know whether it's because the temperatures were turning or the, the, the grapes were maybe almost overripe and they, he didn't want them to go bad. There was some urgency he needed to get the crop in quickly. And so what does he, go, what does he do? Well, he, he does what any of the owners of vineyards would do around that time. They would go to the marketplace and look for people that they could hire to, uh, who might be willing to work. When I was growing up, I remember um, a similar situation. We didn't have vineyards, but we had fish canneries. And in Prince Rupert, uh, you could go down to the canneries early morning, 
I remember I was 17 or 18, and I went down with a friend to the cannery early morning, and you just stand outside the cannery, and in the hope that somebody would say, we need some more workers. And sometimes people would get chosen, sometimes not. But that was very similar. Well, like canneries in Prince Rupert during fishing season, the town marketplace in Jesus' day during harvest season, it was, they were both the same. People who wanted to find work would, would head to the marketplace early in the hope that they would get hired. The really keen ones would get there um, before perhaps the, the sun even rose. So when the landowner in our story today arrives at daybreak, those who are ready and waiting to be hired are snatched up very quickly. And they're told by the landowner that they will get uh, paid a denarius for the day. That was a typical wage for one day's work. Now, laborers didn't often, uh, they didn't always get work, and so they couldn't take such work for granted. There would be times when they would be in the marketplace and they wouldn't get hired. Often they would go home at the end of the day with nothing more in their pocket than they arrived with in the morning. But on this day, the workers were feeling good inside. As they made their way to the vineyard because they knew that at least on this day, the end of it, they were going to be taking home some wages. But there's still more to the story. As Jesus continues to tell the story, he talks about the landowner realizing that at different parts of the day, there's still more grapes that need to be harvested and not enough people to do the work. So he needs to find some more workers. So he goes back to the marketplace. At 9 o'clock, at 12 o'clock, at 3 o'clock, each time more workers are added to the workforce. By 5 o'clock, the task still wasn't completed. Only one hour left. So for the last time, the landowner went back looking for some more. And let me tell you that that those he found in the marketplace likely weren't your typical workers. I doubt they were even there looking for work. I wouldn't be surprised if they had just stumbled out of bed, their clothes were creased, their hair hadn't been combed yet. Likely they hadn't been there looking for work. They were just kicking back, trying to kill some time. Certainly not the epitome of real hard workers, perhaps. And so they get, still get, they get chosen by the landowner, despite the fact that they might, uh, might not have been there looking for work. And I can just imagine them thinking and saying to themselves, hey, it's only one hour. I mean, an hour of work isn't going to kill us, and it's already past the hottest part of the day, so it can't be that bad. So they headed on out to the vineyard. And you know, in what seemed like no time at all, the whistle blew and the workday was over. And it was time for people to go home. But of course, people had to get paid first. Unlike today where you get paid uh, maybe once every two weeks or at the end of the month, People back in, the, and back in Jesus' day would get paid at the end of the day. And we're told that the ones who started the, um, the latest were the ones who were called first. Now, it's important for us to note here that Jesus was being very deliberate in telling his story the way he was telling it. This wasn't just about generosity. God being generous, uh, the landowner being generous to those who were working the shortest part of the day. It wasn't just about generosity. Because if the story was just about generosity, the story could still be told differently. You could have still, you could have paid the people who arrived first, you could have paid them first, they'd go home, and you could still be paying everybody the same, and nobody would be any the wiser, but everybody would have experienced that generosity. But this isn't what the story was about. No, Jesus was telling the story this way, so he could set things up. He knew how the disciples would have been, what they would have been thinking as they heard about the later workers receiving the denarius. They would have been expecting things to unfold the same way as did people in the story who were hired first. You know, I can just imagine the look on the faces of those 6 a.m. workers. When they see those 5 p.m. workers receiving a denarius, 
at first, I don't think it, it would have bothered them in the least. I think they would have looked quite excited because they saw what the landowner was paying the late workers. I can imagine smiles on their faces. I can imagine them nudging each other, whispering, we must have misheard. It wasn't a denarius for the day. It was a denarius per hour. Instantly, their minds would have started picturing the reception they might get when they got home that, that, that night. Maybe they should get some flowers on the way home, bring a bottle of wine home with them, maybe get a special treat for the kids. Those early risers would have been rewarded and many households in that community would have been celebrating that evening. But then all the anticipation building within them instantly vanishes when the landowner hands over their pay. One denarius. Exactly the same as what he'd given to those who'd worked only one hour. For Jesus' audience, for the disciples, this would have been like the rug being pulled out from under them. And just as the first workers in this story had reacted, the immediate reaction of the disciples would have been the same. It's not fair. It doesn't seem fair that those who worked a whole day and bore the heat of the day should get paid the same as those who worked only an hour. And you know, to make matters worse was how Jesus started off his story. Remember how he began in verse, in verse 1 it says, For the kingdom of heaven is like this landowner. The kingdom of heaven is like. Really? Is God really that unfair? What was Jesus getting at here? What was Jesus really saying? You know, I think if we're going to really understand this, we've got to remind ourselves of the context of the story. Where does it, play, where does it fit in what Jesus was doing and saying? If we stay, take a step back, a little bit back in Matthew's Jesus story, um, a little bit just before this, Jesus, uh, we're told a story about a rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he starts, um, Jesus says, you've got to follow, uh, follow the commandments. And the guy says, I've done them all. And then Jesus says, well, go and sell everything and give it to the poor and then come follow me. And the rich young ruler turns away. Jesus then goes on to talk to his disciples about how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. He says it's, it's, um, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then the next part of the story is Peter saying to Jesus, well, what about us? When we've left everything behind, what about us? And it's at that point Jesus tells this story. You see, as far as Peter is concerned, fair is fair. He felt as though because he and the other disciples had been, been following longer, that they had committed themselves to Jesus from the moment he called them, that they, in fact, should be rewarded greater than pretty well anybody else. To think that anybody coming to Jesus later than Peter and the others and receiving the same reward as Peter and the others, well, that just wouldn't be fair. And let's be honest with ourselves for a moment. Don't we often think that's the way it should be? I mean, it appeals to our sense of justice and equity, doesn't it? And we love justice and equity especially when it tips things in our favor. For those who have been following Jesus any length of time, don't we think there should be some kind of benefit for those who have been following Jesus 
longer? Because if it isn't, and, and I'm going to tell you, I've heard this argument before. If it isn't, then what's stopping people going through their whole life not following God, being against God throughout their life, and then at their deathbed, finally turning to Jesus? Surely their reward shouldn't be the same as ours. It just wouldn't be fair. But isn't an important question this? What do we think we really deserve? You know, I think one of the problems so many people have today, actually, maybe maybe I should rephrase it. I think one of the problems so many of us have today is that we kind of look through, look at ourselves through rose-colored glasses. Oh, sure, we're aware of sin in the world. But so often we see the sin in others a bit more significantly than we see in ourselves. Just think back to our passages from Matthew's Jesus story over the past couple of of Sundays. Remember what those passages talked about two weeks ago. It was all about what you need to do when somebody sins against you. And Jesus says, you go to them, you tell them about it. If they don't listen, you bring somebody else. If they don't listen, tell it to the church. But if you remember, one of the things we were invited to reflect on that day was that even though the passage talked about other people's sins, we needed also to think about our own and how we would receive somebody coming to us and talking about our sins against them. Last Sunday, there was the, the, the theme was uh, Peter going to Jesus and saying, how many times must I forgive another person's sin against me? Should it be up to seven times? Peter's whole focus was on other people's sins towards him and where he could set a limit. But if you were with us last week, you remember how we were invited to consider the passage more broadly as to what place we would be comfortable with God at drawing a limit when it came to forgiving our sin. Isn't it interesting how our first reaction with today's passage is about unfairness and how others don't deserve what God is giving to them? The implication is somehow we deserve more. But when did it become all about getting what we deserve? Because if it is about others getting what they deserve, then surely it's got to be about us getting what we deserve. And are we sure we really want that? Too, far too often, when we think about worthiness, I think we figure God grades on a curve. Sure, we're not perfect, but at least I'm better than those people over there. At least my sins aren't as big as that person. How often do we compare ourselves with great saints? We don't do that very often. Instead, we, we look for some real sinner. At least I'm better than them. We're totally fine with, with grace. When God gives it to us, But when it comes to other people, well, they jolly well better deserve it. But that's the whole thing about grace. It's never deserved. And I tell you, I don't believe God grades on a curve. I don't believe God says, as long as you're this good, as long as you've been following this amount of time, as long as you've done these things, then you're okay by me. I believe God requires perfection. And anything less than perfection is failure. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God doesn't say one sin is worse than another. He doesn't compare and say, well, this one is okay, but this one over here isn't. Society does that. It says certain things are worse than other things, but God says all have sinned. 
And because of that, none of us can attain God's righteousness. So what do we deserve? Well, in Romans 6.23, it says the wages of sin is death. Do we really want to be getting what we deserve? If we do, Scripture says that it is separation from God. But the good news is that verse 23 of Romans chapter 6 has a second part to it. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Peter needed to realize that God doesn't grade on a curve. God doesn't look and rank people according to their faithfulness, nor according to their sins. As far as God is concerned, nobody makes the grade. And yet God chooses to pour out His grace on us. And we are in as much need of that grace as anybody else. Whether we've been part of the kingdom from early in the morning or we arrive close to the end of the day, we are in need of God's grace. Now that, that might lead some people to think, so, so then what's the point? If the same reward for those who have been following a long, long time yeah, is the same as those who follow a little bit of time, then what, why bother? Why bother saying yes to Jesus early? But I think one of the things that so many people often fail to realize is that they, they seem to think that the kingdom of heaven is just some place that we experience later on when we die. It's not about some time or place that we're rewarded at the end. Remember what Jesus said at the very start of his ministry. He said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. With the arrival of Jesus, the kingdom of heaven was being inaugurated. Because of Jesus, we can taste the kingdom even now. We can be a part of the kingdom even now. We can be working and ministering in the kingdom now in the presence of the king. Those who come at the last hour, sure, they're going to be welcomed into the kingdom. But how much might they have missed? How much different might life have been had they accepted the invitation sooner? We can be shining God's glory all around us. We can be making a difference for Jesus starting now because we're invited into the kingdom. So I want to leave you with some questions I want you to reflect on this week. First one is this. What difference would it make if rather than comparing yourself to others, you compared yourself to Jesus? To what extent do you identify more with those in our story who were hired first? And what difference would it make to you to make to how you understand grace if Jesus were to reveal to you that in fact you were one of the late hires? And how does that revelation shape your understanding of grace? And how you might live going forward. Many years ago, Jesus told a story about some workers in a vineyard getting paid the same. Regardless how long they'd been working. It wasn't a story about work. It wasn't a story about people. Instead, it was a story about God. Is God fair? Do we get what we deserve? No, but thank God we don't. Because if we did, then all of us would be far from him. It's not about what's fair. It's not about what we deserve. It's about grace. Grace that is offered to all. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your grace poured out towards us. 
Even though we don't deserve your love, you continue to pour out it upon us. Help us to understand the significance of that grace. And may that understanding change us from the inside out so that we can live that grace in our lives. We ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.